Welcome to the Open Mic Podcast Show with Mike Midgley. Hey, and welcome to the Open Mic Podcast. On today's episode, we're getting started fast out of the gate in 2020. We're going to be covering what is becoming more and more important uh, in any business entrepreneur's uh, mindset, or it should be, and that is the topic of storytelling. Uh, today's influencer guest is Michael de Groot from Staying Alive UK, and Michael is based out of Stourport and Seven uh, in Worcester here in the UK. So welcome to the show, Michael. It's great to have you here, and thanks for taking the time out of your busy diary at the start of the year. Thank you, Mike. I'm, I'm really excited to, to come on your podcast. And by the way, I love your title, The Open Mic. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's so clever. Um, so I, I, um, I'm glad we connected on LinkedIn some weeks ago and uh, that we managed to get together on this. Appreciate yeah, it. it's an absolute pleasure and uh, I'm certainly looking forward to it because, you know, for the listeners as well, when you're out there, you know, we've all got New Year's resolutions, whether we keep some or we don't, we go to the gym, we stop going to the gym, we've got to set us goals, do we hit them all, it doesn't really matter. But one thing that seems to be, you know, um, ever present in his lives, whether it's commercially in business, whether it's... Um, you know, in his personal lives, his stories. Mm. And, you know, especially as we move forward into marketing, um, you know, and we move into growing as businesses and moving forward. You know, we've entered into a new decade. It's the start of, you know, 2020. And we talk about this decade of opportunity. You know, we're not going to get political in the show or religious on the show. We just don't do that. But, you know, we're the new government. We're looking at 10 years of opportunity. It's the decade of opportunity. And, um, you know, storytelling is such a big part of that. If, you, if, you, if you're not aware of it, we've got a super, super, super expert here who's going to share, you know, a little, you know, more than a little, uh, a lot of strategies with you, how to get started, do something different, how to stand out. And, um, you know, if you want to connect with Michael, you can do that. Uh, head over to his website at stayingaliveuk.com. Um, Michael also runs an amazing podcast as well. So you can just put the extensions forward slash podcast at the end of that domain. If you're driving or listen to this on any of the apps, don't worry we'll put it in the show links you can pick that up when, you, when it's safe to do so you can check out michael at the twitter as well at staying alive uk or as i said you know we connected on linkedin you know it's that place so check out linkedin.com forward slash in forward slash staying alive uk um so first of all most you may not think this uh, and actually me working in the netherlands um in my business as well i work with a client over in the netherlands um, from Michael's accent, I have to say, I didn't have you down as a native of uh, the Netherlands. I know you've been in the UK a, a good while, um, but tell us about the original journey from the Netherlands, Michael, uh, all the way to uh, Stourport and Seven, you know, in the UK. How did that happen? Well, let me, let me first of all get the name pronunciation <clears throat> alternatives for people. Yeah. So it's in the UK, we had to change the surname to De Groot. Yep. Because no one could say de groot. De groot, yeah. Yeah, and de groot is the, because of the g, the Scots can say it, but <laughs> the, the English people can't, unfortunately. <laughs> so when my father, who, it was his fault, basically, and I'll t just tell you because, of course, I'm a storyteller, so I'll have a tiny little story about that. Please do. So we lived for a period of time. My father worked for the Bank of America, and yeah. he was is it assistant vice president or some big title? And he was posted to a place called Suriname, at the top of South America in between British and French Guiana. Wow. And it used to be a Dutch colony. Yep. Uh, it no longer is, or it wasn't when we went there anyway. But there was a bank there that was failing and he had to go and rescue it, which he did do. And uh, so we lived there for about two and a half, three years uh, from the age kind of early teens and we came back to the Netherlands when we were about 15, 16. And then uh, my father was then, we had to kind of reconnect the schooling and all of that, which was yeah. really tough, I have to say. And then he was being asked to get posted and he was given two options, right? Option number one was London. Option number two was the US Virgin Islands, right? <laughs> Now, my mother, so my father is a was a Dutchman. Um, my mother was Anglo-Indian. Now, what does that mean? Well, she was born in India, but had a very English upbringing and spoke English like the Queen. Yeah. Not quite as posh, but she spoke proper English, no Indian accent at all. 
And so she moved to Europe to marry my, my father, obviously. And she was, I mean, we were brought up kind of dual nationality yes. already in the Netherlands because my mother was very pro English everything. And, you know, we had Sunday morning was like English breakfast, you know, it wasn't kind of Dutch breakfast, <laughs> which is very different. Anyway, um, so of course, she had to choose. And she chose London, of course. Yeah. And I've never forgiven her because <laughs> I have been to the US Virgin Islands <laughs> since then. And it's an amazing place, you know. <laughs> so lovely. that got us to the UK. And I've been here, apart from a short stint in Ireland for about two and a half years, I've been yeah. in the UK for like, you know, 40 odd years. Yeah. And I'm pleased to say I have applied for my permanent residence oh. Uh, and I got accepted, obviously. Oh, that's fantastic. But the strange thing was, in 1978, my yep. father actually got all of us a permanent residence permit. And right. would you believe it? I know we weren't going to be political, but <laughs> even with Brexit, they they discounted it. Wow. They said, no, you've got to reapply. It's crazy, but isn't it? Anyway. And the contributions that you've made to the government and the tax system and, and the economy. Absolutely, It's crazy, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I only joke when I say we don't talk political or religion. No, no, di- no. We will dip into it in and out where necessary, but, you know, obviously we try and be a neutral show, of course, uh, to, but, to try but to but appease talk everybody. about the first week into 2020. There yeah. are a lot of stories there, aren't there? There are, there <laughs> are. But, yeah, we'll, we'll venture into that as much or as little as we yeah. need to do, for sure. But that's a great story story and you know obviously you know if you look there's a great there's a great video on YouTube and uh, I was introduced to it by my clients who uh, I work with in um, in, in Eindhoven in uh, the Netherlands. The light city. Uh, yeah absolutely and uh, Phillips everywhere yeah Phillips 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 um, yeah and even though the even uh, and what I didn't realize till we got there we're big football fans as you know the listeners are we're big Evertonians um, but uh, we did a tour of the PSV stadium and Mariah who took us out there she was fantastic she took us there uh, and I didn't actually know for you football fans out there that PSV Eindhoven is actually um, translates and Michael will probably correct me slightly here but it's it's Phillips Sports Union and it was the Phillips workers who started the the club on a, on a, on a like a Sunday League Park in the 1900s or something, 1913 wow. or something. And I didn't so, even know that. <laughs> yeah, so PSV stands for Phillips Sports Union. And Michael, you could be better at translating Dutch than I am. I'm learning Dutch very, very slowly with Mariah. Oh, um, are you? Yeah, but Union, that's what, I'm not quite sure why that translates to a V. But... I have no idea, Mike, because, <laughs> you know, my Dutch is so bad well, now. It takes I me, I mean, I went to the Netherlands in September yeah. and um, it, it takes takes me about three days before just it to get back, back into it yeah, yeah. yeah it's dreadful it's dreadful it's definitely not my first language anymore it's absolutely language. but yeah so it's it, it's it's fabulous um it's a lovely country and i started saying there's a video on youtube and it says what is the difference between the holland and the netherlands of course there's, oh, yes. there's a number of providences and the, the reason why i raise it is because you mentioned about the you know the southern sort of um, south american connection obviously there's, there's a mm. lot of dutch colonies in and around there isn't there yes. Aruba, Aruba the and and, yeah. yeah aruba and people like that and, and things yes. like that and and uh, it's interesting too but no that's great and uh, and we're pleased to have you in the uk there's a lot of value there for sure thank you um, <laughs> and um obviously you're running your own entrepreneurial business now staying alive um tell us a little bit more about you know a quick summary of what staying alive does for the listeners so um, there's, a, there's a few different legs. Well, there's three legs to Staying Alive UK. And um, the biggest part is creating animations, yes. right? Essentially, the majority is whiteboard animations, but there's a tiny bit of kind of 2D animation in there as well. And um, I've chosen that medium to help businesses explain their stories better, you know, like a short little cartoon. And we can talk about all the different reasons why that Mm. works um, because it touches different areas of our kind of neuro-linguistics, you know, so you've got the kind of images happening, the visual part going on, you've got the auditory part going on, and then the kinesthetic, the kind of feeling that you get from watching something in a short, very, very short video clip. So that's one part of the business. The second part of the business is kind of 
storytelling, teaching people about storytelling. So workshops to say, what does it actually mean? You know, how do you get started? Forget the video bit because maybe you can't afford it or you don't want to do that. But then how do you show up when you are speaking to clients, to colleagues, um, and using storytelling to get your message across? Yeah, that's great. And then the third part, of course, is podcasting, which um, I started because I want, when I ventured into kind of storytelling, I, I wanted to give something back to people out there to say, well, if you listen to these people who've started on a business journey and l- hear their whole kind of, you know, f- literally from birth schooling to their career and then gone into business, other people may learn from that Absolutely. and go, actually, I can do that. I can listen to him, to her. They've done it. Why couldn't I do it? So yeah. allowing people that are fed up of the corporate rat race and the, you know, being just numbers wanting yeah. to get into business on their own, start their own small business, inspire them effectively. Absolutely. And I, it, you know, so those are the kind of three yeah. areas. Yeah. And thank you for sharing that. Sorry. Um, um, I was just saying that uh, the podcast inside of it, you know, we're both as podcasters, there's like that mutual respect. And to me, I class it very much like a public service. You know, we, you know, it's, it's, it's giving back. It's introducing the listeners to, you know, quality, yes. informative uh, uh, guests who have got value to add. Um, I don't think, you know, for anybody who actually wanting to start a podcast in 2020, um, you can shoot us a message or drop the hashtag, the open mic um and we will send you some resources to get started or help you with that or, or, or whatever you need but um i don't think people realize how much effort commitment that it actually takes to do, what i call do it right and we still yes. learn we still learn every day and we're improving the show we're in season five now um and if you listen to the first 10 shows michael they suck they they, they really are bad uh, but it's <laughs> and originally I was going to take them down and, and start it season 11. Uh, sorry, uh, episode 11 is episode one. Right. Uh, but I thought, do you know what? No, I'm going to leave it up because that's, that shows the progression, shows the commitment, the dedication. Definitely. But, but if you are doing it, you know, all I would say is do it right. If, you, if you're unsure how to do that, drop me a message. Use the hashtag, the open mic. I'm more than happy to help you. Send you some free resources. Give you some tips and, you know, help you shortcut some of the errors that, you know, Michael and myself have probably made and, uh, you know, mm. get you on your way. But it's a great medium. And again, you know, you can link stories into that. But no, I appreciate that and you mentioned earlier about like things like the cartoons and to, you know for businesses to help tell the stories i understand that you're thinking about moving that into more of a, a vr experience as well so just tell us a little bit about what that is if you're not sure you know virtual reality of course um but you know tell us you know what's the thought process behind that what are you hoping to bring why vr um and what could you know a potential customer expect with that type of experience so th- this is definitely kind of future gazing yes. that I'm doing, Mike. Um, so virtual reality, let, there's, there's two kind of main areas where, you know, alternative realities are showing up. There's virtual yeah. reality, which means you've got to wear something on your head. And there's augmented reality, which is the area really where I want to go into, yeah. which is where you take a device and you point it to somewhere in the room and you can see that individual item kind of floating in the room and what happened was I was watching an Apple keynote speech when they showed their augmented reality solution on their devices on stage and they had this little platform like a table and they pointed an iPad at it and on the iPad you saw a whole scene, again, this was a game, a whole scene unfolding. Wow. And there were characters running on the table, jumping off the table. <laughs> and I went, this is mad. This is crazy. Now, but I paid attention because Apple have got something like, I don't know, a billion devices installed around the world. Yes. Right? So no one needs to get a headset. All you do is take your device and point it into the room. Now, don't get me wrong. You know, the, the tech people are already talking about the fact that we will not have any handsets anymore in the next yeah. 10 years. Yeah. You know, So what are they going to be? Glasses? Our existing glasses with a panel on it? Who knows what it's going to be? You it's know? going to evolve for sure, isn't it? It's going to be very different. Now, all these predictions have been made before. You know, Mark Zuckerberg uh, backed the kind of headset variety but 
who knows where, where it's going to go. But I want to develop something on augmented reality. Yeah. So imagine this is kind of future game. I have no idea what it's going to look like yet. But, but I the know- great thing, the great thing, Michael, though, there is as an entrepreneur, it's on your plate. You're mm. ahead of the curve. Well, you maybe not ahead of Apple, but who is, you know? But, but no, what I'm saying right. is you're recognizing things. And, you know, part of our show, you know, the open mic is an entrepreneur's view on growth strategies. But in, it, more importantly, um, because that's, that's subjective. What is growth? What, what cycle are you in your business? But mm. ultimately, it's, it's about how to bridge the gap between idea and implementation. Yeah. And credit to Michael here for the listeners. And, you know, it doesn't matter whether you're in mechanical or service-based business, professional sports or anything as a listener. It doesn't really matter. The, the, the key factor is, is Michael's in the storytelling business and, and much more, of course, that's just more summarized. Um, and he's already keeping one eye on the future and he's recognizing how that could be transferred and brought into his own business. The, you know, and what I love about the honesty of Michael there is he's no idea how that's going to play out yet, but he doesn't really matter because what you don't want to be as an entrepreneur, and this is not me lecturing you or anything like that, guys, you know my style by now. Um, but ultimately, what you don't want to be doing is saying, hey, my competitors brought this new thing out, we better go and follow and copy. That's not going to do. Now, you don't have to be the first or the best in the marketplace. You know, Google wasn't the first search engine and XYZ. But ultimately, if you're an entrepreneur, you're serious about growth, you should have time in your diary every week, every month, every quarter, whatever that period looks like, where you are and I think you call it stargazing or casting that into the future and you know summarize it as blue sky ideas guys is what I'm actually saying mm, to you mm. put it on there put some time out there and say hey what I'm doing how can I disrupt the market how can I bring something to my niche or niche or space that's actually going to deliver something and give me an advantage going forward so credit to you there and you know ultimately um, it's exactly where you should be, especially at the start of this period, um, getting understanding technology and, you know, not driving yourself nuts about which way it will play out because we don't know. We don't, you know, if it could be a fly yeah. on the boardroom of all these tech giants, we, we'd be a lot further forward than maybe what we are. But, but the ultimate point is brilliant. I absolutely love the idea. And what I want to ask you is, even though you don't have an idea fully fleshed out, mm. that the apple with the scene playing out and characters jumping off the table, would that be translated into sort of the whiteboard animations that you're doing or the cartoons or the customers about us page on the website, you know, or whatever. Just give us an idea of what, how you think you may be able to use it as rough a, or as rough sketch as it might be. Just share with us how you think you could use your existing services so the listeners can think, hey, I know what Michael does across these three things. How would that actually transfer into AR, etc.? So, for example... At the moment, if you wanted an a AR augmented reality experience, you've got to download a specific app. Yeah. Right. Sign up to the app, and then there might be some technology inside the app that will allow you to then view content. Yeah. Uh, so, just to explain to the listeners very briefly, for augmented reality, you need to have a target. Right. Mm -hmm. So, if you point your phone, let's say, at a lamppost that's got a QR code on it. Yeah you might get some art appearing next to the lamppost or a message or somebody speaking to you. And some of this is already being done, right? This is not brand new, but it's just not visible that much. Yeah, it's not mainstream. No, but that means you've got to download an app, which means somebody has to do something. So yeah. my vision is that actually the camera will already be the app. You don't need to download another app. You'll have a device or some spectacles that you look at the target and you're going to get what you need coming up. So I would work with my clients to develop the target. What's the target going to be? Yeah. You know, so is it a business card? So when people look at the business card, fantastic. it's just somebody's going to pop up from the business card and a little cartoon <laughs> pops up to speak to you. Or is it going to be a brochure that might be just one page, but people look at it and all Sorry. of a sudden it becomes a much bigger thing and people are talking to you, there may be cartoons, there may be real people, it doesn't matter, yeah. right? So, but maybe I'm not even thinking too advanced even, you no. know, I've, I've got to perhaps get my thinking out even further, more futuristic. But I know, I kind of have this feeling inside of me that something's going to happen big in this area. Yeah. And I really want to be part of it fairly early on. Brilliant. Because I, in the past, Mike, I've seen stuff, 
<laughs> the way it's going to go and I've missed the boat. I haven't backed it fully. I haven't gone, I'm going to go all in with this. So although I'm not like spending a fortune on this, what I am doing is I'm already speaking to like universities, yep. getting some support from them. Um, and I've started that process and, and whilst you're starting that process and you've, you kind of, you've got your goal, you've got a bit of a vision, things start coming to you. Yeah. And what I found is that people are coming out of the woodwork that might be able to help me in the future with it. Yeah, that is. And there's a great saying and credit to Brad Martin over at six division in Arizona for this. It's not one that I own, but I use it quite often. And that is the map appears when the car's in motion. And I think that's a right. great saying for entrepreneurs that you can sit on the side saying, Hey, I haven't really got it all figured out. Well, you never will. When you sat on the wall, get off the wall, you know, start moving forward, yeah. left turns, right turns, no entry signs, hills up and down rivers, you know, valleys will mm -hmm. appear. And uh, they, some of those are opportunities, some of those are, are obstacles and challenges that we have to face, but that's how products are done. Products are never built finished on a whiteboard or a wireframe. They're built with real life examples because I don't care how clever you are, what development budget they've got, Apple included, they don't finish it. They, they build a prototype or a beta model and they push it out mm. and then they think, and they, they, they've spent sometimes hundreds of millions on product development and then they go, hey, why did we miss this? And you know, they, I'm not saying it's as simple as the on button or anything like that, but but you know there's something always obvious that comes out of the prototype but no that's yeah. awesome and um, you know um if you've got any if there's any listeners out there in and around the ar space uh, pr space ar space um you want to connect with michael you can do that head over to stayingaliveuk.com connect with you know search michael de uh, or de Grote, should i say <laughs> you got it there with the pronunciation on linkedin we'll put the we'll put the links below in the show notes of course um so as a fellow podcaster, uh, tell us a little bit about the show. Uh, and I know you're a co-host of others as well and where mm. people can listen, uh, Michael. So, yeah, we, we briefly touched on it. So yeah. I won't spend too much time on it. But the Share Your Story um, essentially is talking to other smaller business owners and finding out about their journey. So um, that's in a nutshell, that's what it is, you know, yeah. and it inspires people to get off their chair and do something else and uh, you know in their lives uh, also it's helpful for existing business owners too because they may hear tips and techniques and ideas that they haven't uh, adopted before so yeah. it's for that market too the other podcast that we started um, which is very very new we've only done a few shows it's called uh, story of a speech yeah and essentially I work together with a, a executive coach who teaches people how to become better speakers. Yeah. And of course I'm the storyteller. That's why it's called story of a speech. Yeah. So, and in our initial kind of first series, we've done a, a little bit of analysis in terms of saying, what, what is a story? What is a speech? What's the difference? But then also we've looked at some great speeches within some movies and we've kind of analyzed them um, and kind of saying, well, what's specific about, you know, these speeches? So that real life so examples, good. yeah, which people yeah. can associate with fantastic. Yeah. Uh, and, and that people are familiar with, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, so that's what we've done. So we will be doing more of that in 2020. And it's still a fairly new show, but we're enjoying the process. But like you said earlier, we know we've made some mistakes. Uh, and this is the first time where... You know, we're working together. I'm do, I'm working in conjunction with somebody else. Yeah. Which is a different energy. It's a so different, it's a different dynamic, isn't it? Yeah. Different things you've got to learn. Uh, you know, who speaks first and kind of put each other on the spot and go, I don't know what to say. <laughs> <laughs> the so, good thing is the best ones are always done. And, you know, we bounce off script all the time and it's like, oh, gosh, yes. you know, you know it, it is because if it's even though we have a show book, we have a, if a show format, all the shows follow a similar type of way. The authenticity, you know, authenticity of it, so to say, it comes out with, you know, just picking up and living in the moment and, you know, if it's yes. relevant to the conversation and there's value for the audience. Um, um, you know, I think, you know, we've probably got 10 or 15 pot sort of stages in our podcast process from opening to closing the show. Um, mm. But it probably ends up being 25 every time because we, we, we veer up all the time. And, um, you know, it's just relative and it'd be a crime to leave it out in some cases. Well, that's exactly where we're at at the moment. So in the first few shows we've been doing living in the moment. Yeah. And we've now recognized that actually when we do this, there is a fairly similar format. So we, we need to put a bit of 
preparation and structure around it. And, yeah. and that's the next step that we've got to do. So being very <laughs> honest, you know, we haven't got it sorted yet. <laughs> so head, head over and give it a listen. We'll put the link below, Story of a Speech. Um, give that a listen and uh, give them a follow and a review. Um, it helps us as podcasters. It motivates us that actually we are being listened to, not that it's ego or anything like that, but it uh, go and give uh, Michael and his team a follow there. As we wrap out of your bio and your background, and I really enjoyed learning more about you, Michael is one thing that's really close to my own heart is as entrepreneurs, it's often, you know, uh, our focus is to grow, to uh, create opportunity, wealth or service or whatever it may be. Mm. But sometimes a lot of entrepreneurs I see out there miss giving back to the community. And if 2020 is a goal for you giving back, I mean, I'm a mentor for Doncaster 100 Council. I've worked with HSBC Young Enterprise. I, we have our own community here at, in our agency. Um, and I get a lot of pleasure in giving back to good causes. And I'm, I know you share similar sort of um, traits around that, Michael. So outside of your professional career, just tell us a little bit more about the volunteering and uh, things that you give back to the community. Because it's yeah, a great so, shout. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, it wasn't until kind of 2004 that I woke mm. up to the fact that volunteering is something that existed. You know, yeah. I didn't even know I was in corporate life and I didn't even know that this existed. So once I heard about it, I became more interested in it. So I did a bit of volunteering um, for, for somebody called Tony Robbins. Yeah. Um, and actually it was his course where I heard about it. So I did some crewing for free. Um, um, but I also then joined a charity in Africa uh, for orphan a couple of orphanages. Yeah, yeah. And they were in the UK, very, very small. And they were doing some amazing work in Uganda. So I did some volunteering there, but I had to move physically away. So I couldn't continue. And then I did some volunteering locally for a hospice for a few years. And I, I finished that, it kind of came to its logical end. And then I, something I've always been passionate about is homelessness. Yeah. And big problem um, in the UK at the moment. Pardon? It's a big problem, isn't it, in the yeah. UK, the inner cities? Yeah. Well, not just inner cities, but it's more evident there for sure. When we go into well, our agency in Leeds, it's, mm. it's, it's horrific, you know. And, um, yeah. And it's not just people sleeping rough or on the street or begging. That's just one tiny part of it. Yeah. You know, there are hundreds of thousands of people that are homeless. They may have a roof over their head, but they haven't got a place that they can call home. Yeah, it's a big and, issue. And it starts at a very young age and it's, it's really just a horrible place mm. to be. So uh, I found uh, an organization. There are many very, very good charities around the country, but I found an organization called Crisis in Birmingham. Yeah. Yeah. And um, Crisis are a national charity. They started about 50 years ago when the problem really started to, to get very big and some people in government set crisis up. And it was really crisis at Christmas is what yeah. launched, first of all. And now it's a big thing. It's the biggest volunteering event in Europe every single wow. year. And um, But it's only a tiny part of the process. You know, they do a lot of good work. Now, actually, I've got, I've got a tiny bit of news on it because I've I've actually finished volunteering with Crisis at the end of last year. I've done about three years with them. Oh, and right. I've learned a huge amount about the, the kind of homelessness sector and all of the issues around it. I mean, there are loads more that I don't know about. But I, I've, I would say my knowledge has gone up by at least 50% from yeah. where it was. So my, my plan now is to still stay in the homelessness sector and do mm. something more local to where I live to go into Birmingham is about like an hour on the train, whatever. So I want to do something more local to where I am, but also I met some people as you do when you're working in, in that sector who are doing some amazing things. Um, there's a chap called Richard Layton who works, does some work incidentally for kind of entrepreneurs in the enterprise in Birmingham city university. Mm -hmm. And he has an amazing idea and project to convert pubs to homes or flats there are so, hundreds of thousands of empty pubs yeah. that can be converted to housing, it's amazing. but also not just housing, also have shops at the bottom that they can work in, yeah. that people can work in, but also learn about themselves and support and all of that. So That's I might do some work idea. with him. Yeah. Um, 
so it's kind of a moving target at the moment, but I, I know that I will continue volunteering in the homeless sector yeah. to, to really, you know, do my bit of campaigning, whether it be to my local MP, to the government, some tweeting, and obviously any research information. Crisis are brilliant at pulling together all the research and information. Uh, I've got a, a very short blog with loads of links on my website um, that if people want to learn more about the topic yeah. and all of the different facets of it, they, they can help themselves. Yeah, well, please do send us that link and we'll tag, we'll tag it to this uh, blog. As, okay. as you know, the Thank Open you. Mic podcast will turn into a blog and then obviously that'll get distributed out. So send us that. Also send us any links to crisis or anything like that. We'll be more than happy to, to push those in and give, a, give them a push and uh, some support. Thank you. And good on you as well, because it's great that, you know, sometimes you know, you can't always continue with one specific charity. They're all good. They all have best intentions, but you know, the fact that you're committed to it. And for the listeners out there, if 2020 is your year where you're going to start giving back and you've not quite got off the settee with that yet because you've had other priorities, whether it's fitness or business, you know, just do it. Schedule an hour out this weekend or through the week. Uh, look up on your local charities. You know, for me, my charities uh, are all about children. NSPCC is my charity um, right. that I support, right. um, you know, for underprivileged kids and things like that. That's the part, you know, you've got the homeless sort of angle to it. I have the underprivileged ch- kids. Um, whatever's important to you, go out, just mm. do it. And do you know what? I get more pleasure and more satisfaction and donating and seeing the direct debit going out of um, uh, my bank account every month um, when it's an NSPCC on there than I do anything else. And mm. you know, when you're when getting involved with things like the Young Enterprise Scheme for HSBC, going into sixth form colleges, helping kids in the business sector um, to set up, run, and then shut down a business, and that's the program that that does there. It's it's you get such a feeling for it, and I actually look forward to it. And you know, sometimes better than some of the boring business meetings. Dare I say that? You know, none of the clients that I work with are boring to a degree that some of the meetings get a little bit uh, strained as you know um but no that's absolutely great as i say we'll uh, get that supported uh, make sure that's an initiative if that's something that you want to do and uh, drop me a message use the hashtag the open mic i'd love to know what you're supporting we'll give them a push and a bounce out to our channels as well um and we'll do that from there so appreciate you sharing the backstory that's amazing um let's get into this topic of storytelling it's how yes. we opened up the show um you know a little bit more about michael now what's important to him uh, but what we're going to get down to now is something a little bit more scientific a little bit more detailed um, and some practical actionable tips um, and to kick that out um, and get it framed up um michael The listeners, uh, how can they understand the difference between storytelling, um, you know, um, in most of the adverts that are out there versus um, how the movie business does it? Just tell us a little bit more about that. So I, I often when I do any speaking about storytelling or any workshops, I ask the room, the audience, I said, who likes the adverts? (laughs) Right. That's my first question. And there might be one or two hands go up. And those are usually the people that are in the business of creating ads, right? Most people don't put their hands up. And that's really interesting. I mean, some people go, yeah, yeah, I love the ads. But some people go, no, I don't want to watch the ads. They're an interruption, right? I said, well, who's ever been? The second question is, who's ever been to the movies? And all the hands go up, right? Okay. So what is the difference? So adverts are interruptions to our day-to-day activities. You know, they're, we're watching a program and an ad comes up and it's like in your face, you know, this is the product by us. Now, yeah. don't get me wrong. Some ads are stories in their own right. Most of them are not, but there are some. And even the ad business now are changing. And with this started off some years ago, I, I'm sure we will remember at Christmas time, which is the advert that we all look out for now, which is the company, Mike? Yes, the John Lewis. Absolutely. And the reason the John Lewis advert stands out, because it's a story. And this year has been really powerful, hasn't it, with the Edgar one? I think it's the one that's maybe taken it up a notch again. And, Mm. you know, whether it's the theme tune for us oldies casting back to REO Speedwagon before the modern version or whatever, but, you know, the the child and the the dragon and, you know, and and, and it's just come together. And I I mean, I love all the John Lewis adverts, but I think they really knocked it out of the park this year. It really was striking. 
But you can also see the amount of merchandise that can be sold on the back of that with the yeah. dragon, right? I mean, the Elton John one the previous year was a piano. Well, yeah. not many kids wanted a, we were going to get a piano for, the, for Christmas, were they, quite frankly? No. But lots of people got dragons, I'm sure. Yeah, and box. Um, we got our nieces and nephews exactly that. We got them an Edgar. Uh, we got them an Edgar driving, uh, dragon apiece, and they did a great, colourful illustration hardback book, John Lewis, which actually told yeah. the story of the advert. You know, I obviously got excited, and then all the way through to being, uh, you know, whether it was accepted again or pleased again by lighting the Christmas pudding type of thing. But, but and were, it was a great illustration book, fantastic. Yeah, and there were very many hidden messages in that. In, in the in the, in the story. right in the story yeah because it was there are there are kids that could relate to an edgar yeah. you know even the flames that disrupted everything <laughs> you know there are kids that do that as well they could go oh, you know i'm an edgar really yeah. i behave like that or other reasons saying, oh, I really feel sorry for Edgar the dragon. Yeah. Look at him, he's on his own. You know, nobody loves him and he just yeah. wants to be loved. He wants to be part of it. And there were so many hidden messages. I mean, whoever wrote that did a that's really fantastic. fabulous job. Yeah, no kidding. So that's when I talk about adverts and movies, that's the difference. So when you go to movies in the cinema, I would say to people, you are now sitting in a dark room for three hours right? The Irishman, if anybody knows about that one on Netflix, was also in the cinema. I mean, that's three hours. Who, wanted, who wants to sit through a movie for three hours, yeah, eat so popcorn long. and chocolate and yeah. Coke and whatever, spend a fortune, right, to be entertained, to lose themselves in the story, because they know they're going to be entertained and they're going to be able to lose themselves. No one's going to say, right, let's put three hours of adverts on, I'm going to lose myself in the adverts, you know. It's true. Um, it's a disconnect, isn't it, with the movies? Because, you know, when you go there, it doesn't, you know, and, you know, for those having, you know, a difficult time, sometimes it's an escape and, you, you know, you become a superhero for two hours or three hours right. or whatever. And, you know, then you go out and, you know, it did event, it's like anything, it wears off. You know, you stop talking about the story or the, the plot and then you realize that, you know, you're still back in the situation. But you cannot be 24-7, you know, looking at problems, you know, and sometimes getting away, detoxing, recharging, hooking yourself into a movie is a great way to do that isn't it and you know you, you become somebody else for that it's all your problems are forgotten for those couple of hours or so isn't it and, and i think that's a great why and me and my wife you know if we if we've got some problems um, not, not necessarily personally but you know in our business in our lives you know going to the movies it's sometimes a, a, more of an escape because it's permission not to talk. It's just to sort of chill out, disconnect, forget about it. And you do. And then what you do is you buy into that story, don't you? And assuming it's a good movie, then, you know, you do that type of thing. But it's more than that. It's more than that escapism. Yeah. We have all been conditioned to stories yeah. from yeah. a very, very young age. The conditioning part happens when you're I don't know, two years old, three yeah. years old, when your folks are telling you stories, that's when it starts to kind of, you know, our, our neurons get conditioned to stories. All communication are stories. Yeah. All communication are stories, right? There's very, apart from saying yes and no, um, <laughs> most of the time when business people meet, they share a story. To yep. With each other, they go. What do you do? It's actually not the great. No, question not the best ask, question. But yeah. That's for another podcast. But <laughs> they they want to know about. They want to know your story. They don't say, "Oh, tell me your story." Well, I do, but not everybody says that. But that's a better question to ask. Yeah. Um, because we're curious, we want to know the story, and that's how communication actually takes place. Yeah. Equally, when you read books, I always say to people. Where are the images inside books that are only filled with text? <laughs> Where are they, Mike? <laughs> are you talking to... I, I don't know. It's, it's, um, They're in your head. Oh, sorry. Apologies. You, you yeah. were talking about the association. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. I get it. So, so all the images are in your head, right? Yeah. You create them. So even when you're watching a movie, you are creating new yes, you images are. in your head. 
Yeah, over typing that, over writing it. it. Yeah, I get yeah. that. Sorry, I was and, slightly off track there with the question, but yeah, okay. I understand it. I understand no, no, it. I had trick questions. I know yeah. you're supposed to be asking the questions. No, it's <laughs> fine. It's fine. Keep me on my toes. It's, 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 an, early, it's an early start to 2020 yes. in the podcast. I want to make sure there. you're listening, Mike. <laughs> oh, it's the feedback loop. <laughs> yeah, getting that going, yeah. But... Um, yeah, yeah, because sure. we we are making up stuff in our brain all the time. We are. You know, I I have I have this saying that most stories are created in fear and doubt. Yeah. That's a program we're running all the time. Fear and doubt, fear and doubt. All the thing. I don't know if you saw that Twitter lit up after tiny bit of politics, after this this general in Iran was yeah. was killed right yeah um twitter lit up with world war three yeah. everybody went straight to world war three fear and doubt yeah so all the stories were being created around fear and doubt all the programs jeremy vine on radio two are we, we going to get into world war you know what's going to happen people so the media putting us all into fear and doubt all through the method of storytelling yeah when you watch a movie, the only reason you watch it from beginning to end, because the writers, the script writers, are putting you into fear and doubt right. all the way along. That's great. And I appreciate you clearing that. And I think that sort of segues nice into the next question. You talk about the movie script writers, Michael. Yeah. Um, there's a framework to a story. Now, for those who are familiar with this, that's fine. Uh, there's some additional sort of strategies you can top up on. Um, but for those who are learning this really for the first time, there is a specific framework. You know, we used to be called a story arch or there's various other things that talk around that. Mm. So from your expert sort of viewpoint, Michael, tell us what the framework of a story is and how this is built up. There, there are many around and it depends what people, you know, relate to the yeah. most. But the, the very, very basic one that everybody needs to keep an eye on are four areas. Yeah. Area number one is relatability. Yeah. So people need to be able to relate to the story. They need to be able to feel something that they can understand. You know, if yep. you make it too obscure and you can't really get hold of the story yourself, you can't relate to it, you can't see yourself in the, the yeah. character, then you're gonna be you're gonna lose the audience, right? Yep. The second area, there needs to be some novelty, right? Okay. It has to be novel enough for people to go, Oh, this is new. <sighs> Yeah. You know, so the John Lewis advert wasn't number two from mm. last year. It wasn't Elton John number two. It was something completely novel. But the story kind of feeling of it, it was still an advert. Yeah. We, knew it, we knew it was John Lewis. We could relate to it. We could relate to Edgar. We could relate to the girl. We could relate to, you know, the people around the table. We could relate to all of those things, but it was also novel. Yeah. The next one is tension. Now, to keep your attention, we need to give you some tension. It has to feel like something is about to happen here. It's all going to go wrong. I've got to keep watching to see what see, happens next. Because we're curious minds, aren't we, as human yeah. beings? <laughs> But because we, we have gone into that character, we're kind of willing them on. We know who the baddies are. We know who the good ones are. We're kind of going, come on, come on, you can do this, you know. Um, and then the last one, number four, is fluency. Now, fluency means it has to flow in a way that makes it, you know, comfortable. You're going to sit there and know something else is going to come, it's going to happen. Yeah. It's not It's not going to be jarred in some way. I mean, some people, there, there was a series, uh, I don't think it's finished yet, about, oh, what's his name? Uh, I forget his name now. Anyway, this is, let's say it's a series about a famous politician yeah. who had an affair. Yeah. Profumo, profumo, what's his name? Uh, profumo. Prof, profumo, John Profumo. Profumo. Yeah. The Profumo affair, affair. Right? Yeah, that's right. 
there were loads of messages on Twitter complaining that they kept going back to a year earlier, right? Without any kind of warning. So they kept switching backwards and forwards. That was very jarring on the fluency of, of the, the story. Yeah. Now, you could argue actually adds a bit of spice to it and it's clever writing to go back because often that does happen. But to some people, it was jarring. There was no fluency. Just stick with current time wherever you are. Yeah. Don't keep going backwards and forwards. It's very confusing. You know, I don't know where I am anymore because likely people would have been watching their phone and then look back and go, oh, where are they now? Uh, yeah. Um, the, first, the first time I saw that, really, and I'm probably outdated with it, but the first time I saw that was Lost. You know, I don't remember the TV show series Lost on Sky where they kept going back to previous lives before the plane crash and then yeah, all sorts of... Yeah. And, you know, and, you know, we did get lost. You know, we, we, we did get with it. <laughs> but I suppose it became a cult series in the end as people bought into that as the first way. But uh, I do agree. It's, it's, not a, it's not a critique against what you see. I, I mm. think people do need the fluency. Um, yeah. But I just wondered, what's your take on programs like Lost? And I think there was a new program that came out in the summer last year as well called Manifest on Sky, where... They, the plane went, they took off from one airport and then landed another, but they got lost five years in the middle and then they kept going back and forward. And they seem to be becoming a little bit more popular. Do you think there's a place for that or are they, have they got to be so outstandingly unique? Or, you know, what's your take on those type of programs? So when it came out first, you got lost, right? <laughs> so if the next one comes out and it does the same thing, you can you can now know what's going to happen yeah right so you've got an expectation there's got to be still some novelty in there so yeah. a new name a new story a new plot or whatever but a similar thing's going to happen going backwards and forwards you now mm. know what's going to happen yeah you either like that thing or you don't i suppose is what we say well if it's you, if about you... it's about education Mm. So what the, what storytellers are doing, they're trying to educate you as to this is the way it's going to go. So get yeah. used to it. <laughs> Once it's so it's a bit like novel. It's a bit new. Um, sometimes you can lose the audience. And a good yeah. example of this is Star Wars. Yeah, you had the totally confused. Yeah, yeah. The pre the prequels that came out had too much change in it, mm. right? So when it went to Disney, they went back to the old format and effectively replicated the original movie. Yeah. And, and the, I mean, the last one, very much uh, full of nods to the original movie. And by the way, that was the year I came to the UK and I queued around the corner, London, Wars, Leicester yeah. Square um, Theatre, Odeon, Leicester Square, not knowing whether I would get a ticket or not. Yeah. The queue was that long. I got in and it was amazing, but those were the times, Mike. Yeah, and uh, they, Having that, to queue for cinema tickets. I remember, I remember when our screen in Barnsley, where I originally grew up in South Yorkshire, uh, had one screen and you used to queue out on Eldon Street, round the corner and up the arcade. And <laughs> that's just what it was. And if you were close to the cinema, you had the cover of the canopy. If you didn't, and it was raining, then you got wet there and you were munching on your popcorn, you know, drenched type of thing. And they, they were the days, weren't they? And none of yeah. these mul multiplexes or, you know, 60 different screens or showings, but uh, Tau Tau's moved on, but all for the better, of course. But I remember it, uh, you know, and actually Star Wars, it was the first film I ever went to see myself so wow my, mo my yeah. mother took me it's the first cinema experience i ever had and brilliant don't remember too much about it but uh, no no, yeah, no, I, no. I, it's certainly there so something there in common yeah, yeah and so, I get, no. so you can lose an audience if it's too novel you can't relate to it it hasn't got fluency it's too jarring you know there's not enough tension in it. Those are the four areas we talked about. Yeah. And you mentioned there certainly about the tension side. I mean, you know, we've all been on, you know, especially some of the series, doesn't it? They leave us on cliffhangers, the last in this episode, and then they leave us in this shock horror situation because season two or three or episode four or five is coming next door. Mm. So, you know, we're all curious minded and that tension. And um, talking about the next stage of that, Mike, how that flows through that attention plus tension equals, you know, that, you know, a tension, I know we've covered it a little bit more there, but just mm. can you dig it a little bit deeper for us yes. there? Yeah. So attention plus tension is a dot tension. Explain more about that. Yeah. So this is a made up word by me. A yeah, no, dot tension. T-E-N 
S I O N. Got it. It's really to kind of say to people, if you want a story where you're going to get people's attention, yeah, you need to build in tension. Got it. Right, and that tension often the way that movies stories repeat itself, even in the tiny little advert by John Lewis about the, the, the Edgar, the dragon, right? There was tension in there because what they, where they go is what is and what could be. Yeah. Right. So you keep repeating that. What is, what could be, what is, what could be, what is, what could be. Sorry to repeat it, but no, that's perfect. essentially what you've got to do. You've got to say, you know, Edgar the dragon, you know, just wants to go and play on the ice with everybody. But in his excitement, he melts the ice because of his, you know, flame throwing out of his <laughs> nose. And, and then, so that's what is, what could be. He could be fine playing with the kids. And then the next scene, the same thing happens, burns the Christmas tree or whatever, <laughs> you know. And then the next scene, so it's what is, what could be, what is, what could be. And then he comes into the room and goes, oh, my God, you know, what's he going to do now? And everybody ducks for cover, don't they? They think he's going to burn all the Christmas table. That's right. But somebody, some mentor, some kind of person has come along and saved him and helped him on his journey and gave him the solution so that he doesn't have to burn everybody. You know, and he can be part of, you know... I mean, it's great storytelling. It's exactly the way you've got to go. So it's what is, what could be. So you're building tension all along that journey until finally you get over the line. You know, yeah. you save the day or you save the person. And that what happens in the movies as well, Michael, isn't it? You know, the, you know, the hero, you know, has some atrocity done to him. You know, with somebody's, you know, some thing to do with his family or whatever and he goes on a revenge journey or, or he gets wrongly convicted and he goes on a mission to clear his name and eventually yes. hopefully comes out at the end of that doesn't he it's that type of thing isn't it that you you're got talking it about there yeah you got it spot on and i suppose what i want to drill you down on michael if i could mm. i really enjoyed listening about the what is what could be example mm. so if we've got an entrepreneur out there at the moment who's thinking okay i need to include story in my marketing my advertise it, call it whatever you would do, campaigns. Could you break that down? Uh, you know, you know and, and we've got a saying here on the open mic, it's what we call fifth grade level. So, you know, on simplest level, that you know, you know, anybody at fifth grade level could understand that it's no disrespect to his audience. It's just the simpler it is, the easier it is to understand yeah. and apply. So in a fifth grade level, I'm looking at putting a campaign together. I'm looking to put an adverb together. I'm looking to put a brochure or a story or a campaign yes. or whatever. The medium is irrelevant, really. Could you give me a couple of examples of how the, the listeners could say, right, here's the what is part and here's what there could be in, you know, it could be in any business, a plumber, it could be a shopkeeper, it could be a, a solicitor. It doesn't really matter. Any no. example that you've got where we transfuse this, um, th- this idea about what is, what could be into practical uh, deliverables. Yeah. Could you just share maybe something yeah. that the, the audience could understand? So the, the first place is to understand what the problem is, the challenge. What is the challenge that the client has to overcome that you can solve for them? You you can be the mentor, the advisor, the product, the service that can help them with their challenge. There's got to be a problem, hasn't there? Of course. Otherwise, no one is interested. Yeah. Or an aspiration, I suppose. You want to be better at yes. something or whatever. Maybe yes. learn a language or whatever. But it's still a problem because I don't know how to speak the language. You know, I get that. But sometimes it's aspirational, I think, as well, isn't it? So yes. it's not, we, we're not just, you know, 999 blue light solving here. But, you know, it, it, you know, along the way, it is mm. a challenge. It's a problem. It's an obstacle. It's, it's whatever. Yeah. So you begin with articulating that problem in a yes. story format. You say, Mike, you know, is looking to get, let's say, I don't know. Lose 30, pa- lose 30 pounds. <laughs> is it, well, we won't go into the way thing. Well, well, let's say Mike needs to get his podcast listened to millions of people around the world, right? Yeah. Or whatever. If he doesn't, then this is what happens to him. Yeah. You know, he's going to feel very, I'm, I'm not saying this is going to happen, 
that this is fiction, Mike, uh, is, is going to get very depressed. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and, and then you say, well, what else could happen you know, if he doesn't get listened to by millions of people? Well, he could give up the podcast, right? Well, what else could happen if he's going to give up the podcast? What's that going to happen? Well, he's going to close his business. Yeah. Oh my God, you know, all of these things. So you looking at the story or reading the story or watching it or goes, I can see myself. That's me in that story. I'm a Mike, you know, if I don't do these things, that's what's going to happen. I'm going to close my business as well. So it's it's a consequential damage as well. Yes. Multiple levels, isn't it? Yeah. So it's kind of future pacing. it. so what's the challenge? If you don't fix it, what's going to happen? Yeah. Right. Or what are all the things that are happening to you right now as a consequence of that challenge not being solved? And then at the very end, you give them the solution, right? You say, I'm the here, I'm here to solve your challenge or your problem. Yeah. I am the only person who can do this. Now, the tendency is to go and tell them what the solution is, right? That's too much. Yeah. We've got to leave something to the imagination. We've got to say, just get in touch now, you know, because I can solve your problem. Because as business owner, the outcome we want is people to get in touch with us. Yeah, it's conversion yeah. of some point, isn't it? From, yeah. you know, yeah, strangers to, to inquire or prospect. Yeah. Absolutely. That's what we want because once you've got them communicating you can then go right what's your problem and challenge uh let's get into the meat of it then it's time to give them the solution yeah and often as well you'll find you know to the listeners when you're speaking to potential prospects the reason that they actually give you is really it's more surface isn't it it's never you know there's always a real or more damning reason beneath that and i know when we do a lot of sales work and sales enablement work with sales teams in our agency um you know the sales teams sometimes say, well the customer said or the prospect said this yeah what what is he really saying and sometimes you get blank faces sometimes you Mm. get oh you get the light bulb going well what is he actually saying and it's exactly what you're saying here if i don't get my show listened to do i do i get demotivated do i give up or whatever that might be Mm. um and that's a a real sort of challenge for sales teams to real to get the real reason and sometimes Mm. customers just don't or prospects just don't want to tell you because they're embarrassed you know i'm i'm open i know i use the example earlier about weight loss i you know i put a bit of weight on last year and i really could do with losing it and then i could do with losing 30 pounds and you know and get get back to my ideal weight and you know that's a that's a goal for me this year uh, mm. but not everybody will go to the gym and say hey i'm a little bit overweight i need to lose 30 pounds can you help me you know others will just say i'll go and i feel a bit awkward or you know mm. figure it out for yourself so learn to ask a lot better questions learn to um dig deep and find out the real reason i suppose slightly off topic there michael but uh, i just wanted to make sure the listeners understand it that yeah. what i'm trying to say is that sometimes what the customer is telling you is not always the real reason no that's true it's, yeah that's true yeah. yeah that's and you can you know if, if you're unsure about that you know drop us a message on the on the hashtag the open mic and uh, you know again we'll send you we'll point to some blog for yeah. some examples about that but no I, I get that and you know the what is what could be uh, one thing i picked up on that uh, which i've i've, I've learned something new i always do on these shows so thank you for sharing <laughs> is yes don't tell them everything. Um, leave that suspense. You know, t- I suppose what we are saying is tell them enough so they can connect and, and see that future vision. Mm. But don't tell them everything because otherwise if you give them everything, then ultimately uh, why on earth would they make that inquiry with you? You know, I suppose mm. it, it is ultimately what we're saying. Um, so, yeah, I get that. That's fabulous uh, guidance um, there. Now, right. you use a terminology, and I love this. Um, I'm sort of half-baked, if that makes sense on this sort of topic use the terminology the hero's journey Mm. now for those who have not come across that before what does the hero's journey actually mean michael well it's you took you mentioned story arc earlier yeah i did that's just my old-fashioned way of doing things so i'll I'll just I'll, i'll read this out okay so we start in an ordinary world a humble character gets called to adventure and initially refuses, but meets a wise mentor who trains them and convinces them, convinces them to go on said adventure. They are then tested. They meet allies, 
and they make enemies. They approach a final battle and almost lose it, but eventually find it within themselves to succeed. They return home to an appropriate hero's welcome, transformed by the journey. Interesting. Now, did Avengers, you know... Aven Avengers Endgame there <laughs> comes to Correct. mind. Correct. <laughs> Correct. But did you know that the original Star Wars, George Lucas came across a guy who invented the hero's journey called Joseph Campbell. Yes. Yep. I'm aware Joseph, of Joseph Campbell, Campbell was inspired by all the Greek yeah. myths, the mythology, Greek mythology that had these stories in there already. So yep. this is not new. This no. has been in existence for many, many years. Uh, but Joseph Campbell made it more accessible to scriptwriters and movie makers. Yep. And George Lucas, after he had written uh, Star Wars, the first Star Wars, which was episode whatever. Yeah, three, um, five. But, yeah, whatever. Yeah. Uh, I, I can see the V and then another one or two. Yeah, I have no it. idea. No idea. No. You talked about getting lost earlier. That's, I yeah, definitely that's got it. lost with that. To me, it's Star Wars, it's Empire Strikes Back, and it's Return of the Jedi. And the rest of them, I, you know, if there's any Star Wars fans out there, please don't hammer me. But, you know, there's only three Star Wars films in my yeah. mind. But. Yeah. <laughs> Well, he rewrote the original Star Wars after he came across Joseph Campbell. Right. And it literally has that story arc in it. Yeah. Where, you know, Luke Skywalker was very reluctant, but his uncle and aunt died, so he had to go. Yeah. And, you know, he was helped along the way by Obi-Wan Kenobi and Yoda. Uh, Yoda, and yeah. Whatever, to train him into the... Jedi that he then became right and he won the day so but along that journey he was killed many times over but didn't quite get killed you know but other people did and so all movies up until that point were not along that no. kind of storyline Right. But today so they are, aren't they? You know, you can correct. see that, you know, whether you look at the Jack Ryan type of series, you know, the Mission Impossibles and, you know, whatever, you know, even Indiana Jones to a degree. And that was early on, wasn't it? In the 80s and yeah. things like that. You can see that, and you know, where they, you know, they have that reluctance, they get involved, they meet somebody along the way, they have enemies and, you know, somebody's had to either catch them or kill them. I have a whatever. question then, yeah. Mike. Why don't we get bored of it? Yeah, we don't, we don't do it because uh, I think, is it the relatability factor that that's where we are in life as self or is it the fact that we expect that? I don't know. Does, does that, I suppose that I don't like answering questions with questions, but does the majority of the general public in certainly the movie paying public, do they actually even know that there's this psychology of a framework behind it? Or do they just go and say, hey, I'm now going to watch Captain America beat up Iron Man in Civil War or, or vice versa, or whoever won. You know, or like nobody won. It was a bit of a draw on the airfield, wasn't it, at the end? But It's um, very simple. The, the answer yeah. to that question is really, really simple. Yeah. And it is your story. Yeah. You're watching your story. Every single human being walking on this planet has a story about themselves. Yeah. They have challenges they have to overcome. They have mentors. They have allies. Enemies. They are heroes in their own lives. Yeah. They are heroes to their children, to their parents, to their colleagues in some way. It's our story that we're yeah. watching over and over and over and over. But we are then portrayed in different characters, walking in different uniforms, <laughs> male and female. It really doesn't matter. Mm. Or, or fictitious characters as cartoons as well. Absolutely. It doesn't even have to be real. I mean, one of the cartoons that I grew up with, um, although it was filmed before my time, but it, as, a, as a young kid, was The Wacky Races. I used to love The Wacky Races in cartoons. And those people, as daft as were real to me. You know, yeah. Hong Kong Fui, that Hanna-Barbera era, they people yes. were real to me. You know, and um, even though they were you know, fictitious drawings and you know, animated right. flick, flick books, really, weren't the, they? Really? For me, it was the Flintstones. Yeah, again, uh, yeah, equally, yeah. 
Yeah, and, and it's <laughs> they the same were very thing. real to me. <laughs> yeah, and you didn't treat them as cartoons. And I, mm. the most, I wouldn't, it wouldn't go amiss. I, I know we'll get some comments if we don't mention it, but the ultimate one is obviously over modern times is The Simpsons, isn't it? Yes. And what, what is that? It's season thirty or something ridiculous. Unbelievable. Like yeah. You know how they've, they've taken that, and especially because you know we talked about political and religious and and prejudice. Uh, how we always try to you know tiptoe through those subjects on the show, just so we don't you know we try to keep, keep a neutral audience. But the amount of suppression, prejudice, criminal activities, mm. racial mm. prejudice, you know. Um, you know, domestic prejudice that goes off in the Simpsons. You know, it, it's bizarre it's got how everything. It's how, got everything. It yeah. is so diverse. But I think I, I'm, I'm trying to back up what you're saying there, Michael, about being the story that you know whether you believe you're Homer Simpson or you believe that you're, you're the suppressed Marge or frustrated Marge or you're the criminal gang of you know Fat Tony there or mowing the bar, which is you know a crazy, crazy goings off there, all sorts and mm. Barney. You know, you know, and then there's a pool game so much abuse in the shop and you know in, in today's area don't get me wrong i just want to be clear guys i'm not condoning or anything but i'm just saying is how they treat him you know as yeah. this sort of asian shopkeeper with the petrol pumps and that you know it, it you think and i know there is a, a case to move that out that sort of character and that sort of thing but you know it, you know it, it makes you wonder how um, it's not being called out maybe more aggressive because in today's, you know, politically correct world, and again, I'm not condoning or agreeing with anything. I just want to be clear about that, guys, mm. um, is that that show, you're right, it's everyday life, I think, is what I'm getting to, Michael, yes, isn't it? Yes. Maybe exaggerated and, and, and things like that, but mm. it, it comes to life that way and uh, how it runs for 30 plus years and outsells and sells and sells. And not only did they make a movie, I think it was 2008, nine. I think they're bringing another Simpsons movie out as well so that franchise in its own right has been probably one Incredible. of the ones that yeah that we accept but has been wildly successful despite that diversity and, 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 and prejudice that sometimes is in there so I do get it and, and I do love the point that whatever you store as Michael said it is your story whatever story that you're dealing with uh, deal with it um, mm. you know live it and you know I suppose from an entrepreneur's point of view don't quit you know, work it out figure it out get better at it find out how to provide more value find out how to um, you know deliver great services and whether that's blue sky thinking like Michael's doing in the AR space or whatever it doesn't really matter but live your story and if you want to share your story with us use the hashtag the open mic we'll get that uh, looked at if you don't want to share it publicly shoot me a private message you can get with me on LinkedIn or you can do that uh, through Twitter um, so that's great. I love that idea. And as we wrap up the show, I know we've touched on the brain and the psychological of buying decisions earlier, Michael, but tell us a little bit more about how storytelling affects the brain for us to make decisions, yeah. which, which ultimately for our, us entrepreneurs, if we can get storytelling better or get better at storytelling and bring this into our marketing and our business and our team's communication, um, then that can positively, or I suppose negatively, if you don't do it, affect the way your customers potentially buy. Um, so talk to us a little bit more about that, that neuroscience or, or, or the areas around that, that, how storytelling affects the buying decision of the customers. Okay. So this, so I like, I normally things are in threes to help yep. people remember, but this is in fours okay. again. Um, so the first area is uh, something called neurocoupling. Yeah. So where a story affects parts or activates parts in the brain that allows the listener to turn the story into their own ideas yeah. and experiences thanks to a process called neurocoupling. Yeah. So you've already got neurons in your brain that have certain parameter stories from what has happened to you in your life previously. So if you hear somebody else's story, you've got to make sense of it or watch a story. You've got yeah. to make sense of it and put it into your own language. So your brain goes and finds your own stories and then attaches those new information to that, brings yeah. it forward and kind of goes, look, that bit of new story you've got, you've already experienced this previously. So now yeah. you can make sense of it, right? A really important part yeah. of making sense of what a story is. Yep. The other one is mirroring. Okay. By the way, this has all been researched. There are scientific papers around this. So this is not 
me making it up or somebody else making it up. So this is like are, mirror. This is like a mirror neurons sort of example. Yeah, the mirror so. neurons. Yeah. yeah. So, what happens is you're mirroring to what's going on for that individual. Yeah. Right. So, you will experience similar brain activity to each other, including the speaker. So. To a degree, we've been doing that even we're just kind of talking to each yeah. other, sharing stories, you yeah. know. We're experiencing similar activity in our brain, the mirror neuron, as you said. The other one linked to that is the cortex activity. And this is the same happens when you visualize, right? So when, and they did, they've done research on this, you know, a, the simple way to explain this, that if you wired up an athlete sitting in a chair with brain sensors on his head or her head, and you got them to imagine that they are running a hundred meter race, the brain and the muscles fire As based on are. what they're doing in their brain, just visualizing it, right? Amazing. And therefore... When you're watching, you know, when you watch a movie, sometimes you can walk out of the cinema exhausted, <laughs> but you've sat in a chair doing nothing apart from eating popcorn, right? Yeah. I'm not saying the popcorn's made you exhausted, but you kind of go, whoa, I've just been on a roller coaster ride in that movie. You know, that was so exciting. You so know? Does, it, does that work for tension as well? You know, like you see these crime th thrillers where you, you, you know, the terminology is you're at the edge of your seat, and you're biting yes. your nails, and the, but you feel exhausted afterwards. You think, God, I'm glad it's over. You know, is that, is that yeah, the same sort of example? Yeah, your physical body takes part. Mm. With, although you're sitting, you're, you're, things are firing all in your brain as if yeah. you're literally... You're running, you're cycling, you're racing in the car, you're doing all of those things with yeah. them, you know. And the last one, and most people will be familiar with this, is dopamine. Yeah. Kind of pleasure chemical in the brain. You know, and dopamine, when, it, when there is an emotion, emotionally charged event that takes place. So, you know, when you're watching Edgar... Yeah. Um, emotion came up you know oh poor edgar i mean a lot of the john lewis adverts make people cry yeah. in lots of ways you know and they remember that they cried as well and that's the thing an emotionally emotionally charged event dopamine is released into the brain yeah. and it kind of solidifies it in the brain you're going to remember it for yeah. years because emotion was involved in it. Yeah, emotion. So when you do something clever in, in terms of your marketing mm. and you tell good stories that have emotion in it and pe people will remember it forever. Yeah, that's brilliant. And I love that. And just that last line, not to take any value out of the previous four points because there's such an amazing build. Um, but, you know, just tell stories that people remember, you know, and it's... Yeah. And it's it, it's one line. It's something I probably put in the blog quote. Um, it's it, it's real. You know. Um, you know. We always remember. It doesn't matter what we did when we was younger. It may be a school ground incident, a school playground incident. It may be you went on a, a teenage holiday with the boys or the girls, and somebody does something crazy, and twenty years later you meet up as a reunion, and you say, "Hey, do you remember when? You know, certain. You know, these are this event happened, or this person did that silly thing." For me, I went on a lads' holiday when I was a late teenager, and one of the lads fell off one of those rubber banana sausages in the sea, cracked all his head open. And of course he didn't have any insurance and all the lads used to have to cl club together. And at the time it cost us, I've got to go on like a late eighties here. And he had to, uh, we all had to club him to pay the mm. doctor to stitch his head up. And, wow. you know, and then we always said, we are never going on holiday with him again. I'll keep him nameless just for embarrassment. But yes. we're not going on holiday with him again because he was just a loud mouth. He got into fights. He mm. spilled beer. He did wrong things with girls out there. He fell off the boat, cracked his head open. He was just a disaster. And that's what, 1988, 89, and I can sort of visualize it today. So it's exactly the same. And when we get together, we'll all say, oh, do you remember when? Yeah, we remember when. That cost me so much. And, you know, some of us had more money than others. And we all chipped in to make sure he got his head stitched up right and things like that. And, you know, he had all his hair shaved with iodine all over it. You know, oh, you can be wow. very specific with those memories. So it does work. So if you're in any doubt, what I'm going to challenge you with now is put Michael to 
the test, put us to the test. We know it's going to be right, but it'll be fun. It doesn't matter if it's funny, humorous, a little bit sad, if you're comfortable sharing it, send us a message using the hashtag, the open mic. Tell us something that, you know, you always go back to. What is the one number one story that you remember? And uh, me and Michael have a little bit of a chuckle about that when we uh, see that, and it'd be good to learn it. But it is, it's absolutely right. And yeah. uh, thank you so much for bringing that memory back as well. Uh, I forget how many pes- <laughs> You're forget- I forget how many pesetas it cost me at the time and what the conversion rate was. I don't know, two hundred to the pound or something at the time. But uh, yeah, it- it's absolutely right. It's been an absolute pleasure hosting you on the show, Michael. Thanks for sharing Thank so much you value. Thank you for your time. Um, so, for the listeners, as the wrapping out of the show, you know, we've talked heavily about storytelling. We've given so many examples. I hope you've had some value. Please connect with Michael, to, you know, and, and say thank you and, and maybe share with him what, you know, is the, the number one takeaway that you've had out of the show. Uh, but just as we wrap out of the show, Michael, could you maybe summarize um, for the, and, you know, the entrepreneur out there who wants to get started with storytelling? Um, you know, obviously you could connect with Michael and hire his services as well if that's what you want to do. Head over to stayingaliveuk.com. Uh, but if they want to get started on themselves, what would be three pro tips that they must do to make sure they get started off on the right you know, mm. format and, and, and progress in the right direction? Yeah. Well, I've, I've, if people are interested, and I really mean that, I've got something called Storytelling Canvas, which yeah. breaks that like blocks where they can kind of fill out the information to help them on the journey oh, of brilliant. creating a story. But the, the kind of three things that I would say that you need to get cl- clarity on to begin with before you even write anything, and that is, what are your client's pain points? Yeah. You know? What is go- what's the story going to be about? It's going to be about their pain points, right? And how can you create more pain as well in the story? Yeah. You know, escalate it. So they've got this issue, but if they don't do anything about it, then that's going to happen. If they still don't do anything about it in three years time, that will happen, you know, yeah. so kind of build on it. Number two, who's the audience that is going to be listening, seeing that story. Be really specific who you're targeting. We are too woolly in, well, it's okay. It's for everybody. No, it's not. You can't deal with everybody. It has to be really specific. So who's the audience you've got to, because then you get clarity on how you're going to shape the story. And then the third thing, what you want to achieve with the story, what's the outcome? And if others heard the story or saw the story, what are are they going to be saying about it? That's good. What are they going to be sharing to other people? That means, you know, referring you basically based on the story that they've seen or heard. They say, go and check Mike out because he, he has an amazing story, has an amazing podcast, whatever. You know, you want people to be able to remember it, as we've already talked about. Um, Yeah. And and what you want to achieve, what's the outcome? You know, do you want them to go online and buy the product or service? Or do you want them to pick up the phone and speak to you? Um, Do you want them to become a client? Do you want them? Are you referring them somewhere else? What is the outcome? Yeah, and that and and you know that that's such good advice because it's often you know I see so many times oh we're going to put this social post on like why well because I need to post something no you don't you know you don't need to post something what are you doing it for you know is it a brand awareness are you trying to promote something are you referring are you engaging in somebody else why are you doing that you know and mm-hmm. and that's exactly the same in this situation yes. you know you've got to have that end goal because if you don't have an end goal you're just going to wander mindlessly and if you are posting just random mindless non-targeted social out there or email broadcasts then mm. you know you, you would probably i would probably bet and i'm not a betting man i work too hard for my money but i would probably bet that the engagement or the conversion is a little bit lower than what it could be if you mm. took michael's advice and you really focus down on a specific audience solve one particular problem or multiple problems and obviously understand the outcome that you want to make um, so that's fabulous um the value has been outstanding it's a fabulous way to start 2020 thank you You're so welcome. much michael and again if you want to connect with michael head over to stayingaliveuk.com you can follow michael on twitter at stayingaliveuk uh, um connect with him on linkedin and again don't forget to check out his 
podcast with forward slash podcast on that domain. We'll put the links below. It's been an absolute pleasure, Michael. It's, it's, if I can ever return the favor, let me know if you want to get me to share your sto- my story with your audience. Yes, please. Uh, I have a bit of a roller coaster one, uh, ups yes, and downs. Yes, please. Highs of the mountains, lows of the valleys, and lots of scars along the way. And, um, See, you, know, you just proof proved the point. You just proved the point, Mike. <laughs> Everyone has a story. <laughs> we certainly do. And your story for 2020, I hope it's wildly successful as a listener. Yeah, and I, I, you do a fabulous work. I've seen some of the, art, the artwork and, and things like that, so keep it up. And for you as the listeners, we appreciate the time that you're taking to listen to our show. We know you've got a lot of choice in the podcast market and blog market. We appreciate you sticking around. As always, for 2020, go do the hustle. Go make it happen. And we're going to catch up with you on another Open Mic Podcast next week. God bless. Take care. See you soon. You have been listening to The Open Mic, brought to you by The Success Hub. To find out more and to get the resources we have mentioned in this podcast episode, simply visit blog.thesuccesshub.io and view the podcast section. Thanks for listening and we look forward to catching up with you in our next episode. This podcast and associated materials is published under copyright to The Success Hub. All rights reserved. No reproduction of this material is permitted.